Hallelujah. Father, we pray that you help us to remember that we are on transit. That whatever it is that we do here, we will account for it. Help us to remember that repentance is now. Help us, Lord, to remember that there is a beautiful place. There is life after life. Lord, that we will not live the life here anyhow. That we will live the life that will give us access to your kingdom. Father, even as we share your word tonight, we pray that you take control. I hide myself behind the cross that you use me for your glory. Father, we pray that everyone who is connected tonight and who is eventually going to connect will be blessed with that which you have blessed us with tonight. Take all the glory, honor, and adoration in Jesus' name. We pray with thanksgiving. Amen. <laughs> yes, so welcome everybody. Welcome, Mama Emanuela. Welcome, Mama Dora. In fact, welcome everybody who has just joined. I will not like us to exceed one hour, so I'm going to try to be a little bit fast. By the grace of God, as I wrote in the description, we are going to share on the topic handling other people's fame. In other words, you can say handling other people's success. You know, this is Holy Week and we're talking about what happened to Jesus and he landed on the cross so that you and I can get saved. But by the grace of God, he gave me this message on Saturday and I'm sharing the message as I got it. Our main passage is Matthew chapter 27 from verse 18 to 20. Matthew 27, 18 to 20. I read in the name of Jesus. He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. <laughs> Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Most of us, we, in fact, all of us, we know the story of how Easter came about. Yesterday was Palm Sunday. Jesus went into Jerusalem and subsequently he's going to be betrayed and then and then he will go to the cross and eventually resurrect and after 40 days he will ascend into heaven. But, the focus for today, the focus for this exhortation is the fact that the, 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 the leaders, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, these are not people who don't know the Lord. These are not people who don't know the laws. These are not people who are ignorant. These are not people who are illiterate. These are literate people who know the laws, who are conversant with the things of church. But the Bible is saying here that they arrested Jesus out of envy. What this means is that as a child of God, as long as we are on planet Earth, there are going to be people who are going to be uncomfortable, who are going to be unhappy, who are going to be ill at ease because we are more successful than them. That more successful even, if you want to look at it, if you want to quantify it, if you want to measure it, maybe it is not even up to 0.5. But because human beings are the way God has made us, we know the one may man pass away. Even if the man pass away now we one thing, we the one may all thing be now for we. We are always this kind of people who are like a mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all. And we want to be the fairest all the time. We forget that even for forest, tree must ever day we talk past you. That that tree is taller than you does not mean that welcome my Brenda, welcome Papa DJ Mike, Deep. good to have you on board. It does not mean that, that because that tree is taller than you, you who is short, you are valueless. It is just because we spend more time looking at the tall tree, what the tall tree is able to do, that we lose sight of what we, the short trees, are able to do. The Pharisees would have been the kind of people who would have worked well with Jesus. Because they are envious, because they are jealous, because they are bitter, because, you know, they don't want anybody to come and take their place. Welcome, Mama Rosemary. Good to have you on board. They don't want somebody who they have been shining for a long time. And then somebody from nowhere, a carpenter's son, wants to come and say he's the Messiah. It cannot work. And so they are doing everything out of envy, and out of jealousy. That is how some of us are, even in the church. 
We cannot handle other people's success. We cannot handle other people's fame. That that sister sings better than you, it is giving you sleepless nights. That that brother is a better usher than you are, it is giving you sleepless nights. We forget that if that brother is a better usher than you are, it means that there is something that you two can do that that brother will not be able to do as well. You look at even the story in Acts chapter 17 verse 5. The Bible clearly says that the people, the mob, they are angry because Paul is doing what he has done. And out of jealousy, out of envy, they stare a mob, they stare a crowd. And eventually, Paul is thrown out of the city. That is why I said that even in the church, even amongst the gathering of brethren, even amongst the people who are believers, even amongst the people who are, you know, the assistant Jesus and the assistant Holy Spirit, there are people who have not yet been able to deal with this aspect of jealousy, who have not yet been able to go to God and say, Lord, help me. Because the Bible says envy rots the bones. It does not rot the bones of the person who is envied, but it rots the bones of the person who is envious. That is why you discover that even the disciples, they've not had full understanding. And they are sitting in Luke chapter 9 from verse 46 to 48. They are arguing, hey Jesus, who is the greatest? Who is the, the Luke is saying that I'm the doctor, so I'm the greatest. Matthew is saying I'm the task collector, so I'm the greatest. Uh, uh, Peter is saying I'm the fisherman, so I'm the greatest. And Jesus looks at them and like, are you people for real? Is it about who is the greatest? And even if you want to look at the person who is the greatest, the greatest is the one who takes the kingdom of God like a child. Because the more childlike we are, the more Christ-like we'll become. That is why you can conveniently go into a classroom and ask the children who is the best in this class. And the person, the child will easily tell you with no bias, with no hard feelings. The person will easily tell you this person is the best, this person is not the best. But we adults, before we want to say that another person is the best, we begin to feel like making that person the best makes us the worst. No, the more childlike we are, the more Christ-like we become. So it makes it easier for us to stop envying, to stop being jealous, to stop being angry. Because that I appreciate you does not depreciate me. That I make you or I tell you that you know this thing that you are doing is good does not remove anything from me. Because if you are famous, if you are successful and I'm your friend or I'm close to you, somewhere, somehow, in the sentence of your life, my name will feature. Welcome, Mama Irene. Good to have you on board. And so we should be the kind of people who, even in church, we mind how we handle other people's fame. Because when we give in to jealousy, to envy, to this and to that, those are the things that can begin to make, you know, the bile in our system to burst. And before too long, the things that we'll be saying, the way we'll be behaving, will be different from the usual. Welcome, um, Mama Cindy. Good to have you on board. The next place that we have difficulties in managing people's success, in, you know, handling other people's fame. I said I was going to be fast because I don't want us to exceed one hour. The next place is the family. We have looked at the church. We have said that even in the church, there are people who are envious, who are jealous and bitter because other people are more successful than them. In the family, it is the same thing. Because the people who are in the family are human beings with flesh and blood. It did not start today. You look at the example in Genesis 4, from verse 1 to 24. These are two brothers, Cain and Abel. And they decide to offer sacrifice to God. Now, Abel is offering a better sacrifice than Abel. If Abel had taken the time to consider, or rather Cain had taken the time to consider, that God is accepting my brother's sacrifice. Let me ask my brother the kind of sacrifice that he offered to God so that I can also do same and my sacrifice will be accepted by God. Cain will not have ended up a murderer. But because Cain is, his mind is clouded with jealousy. His mind is blinded. His mind is, you know, be clouded with envy. He does not even take time to reason. And that is why even when God is telling Cain that Cain, sin is knocking at your door. Don't open the door. Don't give access to sin. Cain is not listening because the matter has already reached here. It's just remaining like this tap before it bursts. And eventually it bursts in the family. And the first murder is committed. Who taught Cain how to kill Abel? If not the jealousy, the anger, the envy from within. Jealousy kills. It is not just Cain and Abel. Look at David and his brothers. If you look at the story in 1 Samuel 17, from verse 28 to 31. Before now, Samuel has come to anoint the king of Israel. And David is not even there. So it's not even something that they will say that uh, David has, has a, a what? negotiated or he has bribed somewhere. He is, he is not even in the picture. 
And Eliab and the other brothers who are making fine boy, uh, you know, correct, correct people things, they are thinking that they are going to anoint them. Because God is not moved by how fine boy or how fine girl you are, or a uh, fine boy and fine girl I am. God looks at their heart. God sees that these people, their heart, he has malaria. And so he decides that no, somewhere, don't anoint this one. Go and anoint that one who is in the forest, who is also a fine boy, but is not very concerned about the fine boy things. Is concerned about the work that is supposed to be done and has a heart for people and not for fame or for money. And what happens? The thing begins to annoy Eliab, the elder brother, until when David eventually goes now to the battlefront where Goliath is threatening hell. What does David do to his brother? His brother answers him that, what are you doing here? Have you left those here, you, one and a half sheep that you were supposed to be taking care of? And David is offended. David is angry. David is asking his brother, what have I done now? That is how in the family, when others are successful, when others are doing well, and you know, you are not able to support them. You are not able to appreciate them. You are not able to be their, their fan club because by being their fan club, by clapping for them, in effect, you two are part of the story. You two are part of the success story. But these David's brothers, they don't cheer him up from the beginning. They try to discourage him. They try to belittle him. They try to minimize him. But thank God that at the end of the day, when David eventually defeats Goliath, Eliab comes to his senses and begins to support his brother. That is how it should be. Even if we have made mistakes in the past, it is time for us to go back to God, to come back to our senses and begin to support that person who God has blessed so that consequently we too can be blessed. What about Joseph? We are still looking, about, looking at how to handle people's fame and success even in the family. Joseph by nature, in Genesis 37 from verse 11 to 36, the Bible says that Joseph is a correct gentleman, handsome in order. But Joseph is not moved by all those things. Joseph has integrity. Joseph is, is, is somebody who is upright. He does, not, he does not mix himself in things that don't glorify God, in things that don't honor God. And his brothers are angry because first, their father loves Joseph more than all of them, which is not the right thing to do as a parent. And then, it does not end there. Joseph is the one going to report all the bad things that they are doing to their father. Then to crown it all, Joseph is the one dreaming how they will bow down before him. A small rat, a small mosquito like Joseph. How, do, how, how his brothers could not believe how they, able-bodied men, will come and bow down before a small rat. But God is not moved by sight. God is not moved by might. God is not moved by right. God is moved by the state of our hearts. God has seen that Joseph's heart is right. That is why even when he takes Joseph to the place that he takes Joseph, he knows that Joseph will overcome Mrs. Potiphar. He knows that even in the prison, Joseph will still be an example. That is why he knows that this particular one, I can vouch for him. I can prepare him for leadership. Because in Genesis 50, 20, he would tell his brothers that you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. With the kind of heart that Joseph's brothers had, they were scared because they knew that if they were the ones in Joseph's position, they must revenge. Forgetting that vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. That is why it is difficult for them to truly believe that Joseph has forgiven them. They are coming and begging that now that our father is dead, he will surely, re he will surely revenge. He will surely pay us back in our own coins because if the tables were turned, that is what they will do. But Joseph, shows them that it's not about how much you beef me. It is not about how much you compete with me. It is not about how much you fight me. It is about the perfect will of God being accomplished in our lives. When we don't, when we don't handle other people's successes well, we, we, we become blind. We don't longer, we no longer reason as we are supposed to. It weakens our ability to improve, to, to become better people, to become better versions of ourselves. That is why it is important not to be envious, not to be jealous, because it was jealousy, it was envy, and all the things that caused the Pharisees to, to, to send Jesus to the cross. And what happens? You discover that even when we go to the place where we are supposed to be working, amongst our colleagues, there are people who cannot handle other people's success. They promote you by even 0 0.1 centimeter, and the next day your colleagues are not in talking terms with you. Before you know what is happening, you enter the office, you greet people, good morning, they have selective deafness, they don't hear. 
But when other people greet them, they hear. Yes, that is part of life. Those things happen from time to time. That is why even somebody like Judas, who is Jesus' colleague, Jesus' worker, Jesus', you know, financial secretary and all the, the treasurer, Judas cannot handle Jesus' fame. Judas is not with Jesus because of, of what he wants to learn from Jesus. Judas is with Jesus because of what he stands to gain. And so that is why in Matthew 26, 15, he is going to ask the Pharisees, what will you give me if I betray him to you? The Bible says that somebody will betray Jesus. The Bible did not say Judas will betray Jesus. The Bible says woe to him. The Bible did not say woe to Judas. The Bible said woe to him by whom the, 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 the son of man will be betrayed. So Judas chose by himself to put his name in that blank space. And when he goes and asks, welcome Papa Epitime, good to have you on board. When he goes and asks that, what will you give me already? He is signing his death warrant. Because you cannot shake hands with the devil and your hands remain the same. No, if you give the devil a handshake, be ready to lose even the, in fact, from the, uh, what's this place called? From the shoulder downwards, if possible, even your life. Because he would take and take and take. And that is why you discover that even when Jesus is telling them in John 13, 21 to 30, they are asking, hey, Lord, oh, who will be the one to betray you? Jesus is saying that the one to whom I will give this bread. If Judas had not lost his sense of reason, he would not have taken the bread from Jesus. Because Jesus has already said, the person who takes the bread is the one who will betray me. Anybody in their right thinking senses will know that, ah, no, I will not take this bread. And the Bible records in that version, in John's version, that it is as soon as Judas takes the bread that the devil enters him. If we are not envious, if we are not bitter, if we are not jealous of other people's success, we will be level-headed enough to know where to draw the line. In Matthew 26, from verse 21 to 25, Jesus is saying that one of you will betray me. Jesus did not say, Judas, you will betray me. He said, one of you. And everybody is asking, am I the one, Lord? Am I the one, Lord? Judas, too, is asking that, am I the one, Lord? As if. He does not know what he has done. And then what happens? Judas, they say, they, they, Judas, Jesus says that Judas, you, you have used your mouth to say it. And then the people say, but Lord, how will we know? Jesus says, the person with whom I will dip my bread in the wine together. Judas is not still reasoning as a colleague that that sentence means that don't dip your bread in the wine. No, he's so carried away by his, his anger and envy and jealousy that he dips his bread in the wine. And eventually he betrays Jesus. Who is that colleague? Who is that friend? Who is that relative? Who is that person who, because of their success, their seeming success, because all of us are successful in our own domains. You can sing, I can dance. You are a successful singer, I'm a successful dancer. You can clap, I can do, do what? I can, you know, fix the, 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 the church before the service. You are a successful clapper, I'm a successful interior decor. Success is success. The spelling is the same. But because we are too concerned about considering other people's success, we lose sight of us. Judas was a good financial secretary, even though he used to steal from the accounts from time to time. But he would have just remained in that position. He would not have gone ahead to ask that, what will you give me? If I betray this man to you. And at the end of the day, what happened? Judas eventually dies before Jesus. That is how when you get somebody out of a, a, a position or out of a place that was not meant for you. Sometimes you will go before that person. Sometimes you will go after that person. Or sometimes you will remain and you will be so miserable. So miserable that you will be the kind of wanderer that Cain became at the end of the day. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You discover that sometimes also amongst friends, it is difficult to manage another person's success. Especially if the other person is doing so well and you are not finding yourself able to meet up or able to even understand what the person is doing. See, as human beings, when we are at the same level, there is no room for competition. There's no room for envy. There's no room for jealousy. If you look at the Bible in 2 Kings chapter 7, from verse 3 to 20, these are four leopards. They have the same predicament. They have the same issues. And so when they go and discover that there's bread in the land, nobody's fighting each other. Nobody's beefing their friend for anything. They have gone and they have brought good news and God has used them to bring salvation to the land. They are able to do it together because they are at the same level. They have a common enemy. They share the same predicament. Welcome, Mama Laura. Good to have you on board. But if you look at the kind of friendship between Jonadab and Amnon, their story is told in 2 Samuel 13 from verse 1 downwards. 
Amnon is the prince. Amnon is David's son. And Jonadab is his friend. Jonadab is his advisor. But the fact that Amnon is a prince and Jonadab is not, it gives Jonadab sleepless nights. It is that sleepless night that makes him to give his friend bad advice. You will ask me that did he force his friend to take the advice? He did not force his friend. But sometimes when you tell somebody something, the person believes that, ah, this person is my 247. This person is my personal person. And especially if the person has already confided in you, the person might be able to take what you are saying, hook, line, sinker, without checking, without questioning. And that is exactly what happens to Amnon. When he says that he's in love with his sister or he's in lust with his sister, and he does not know what to do. Jonadab, the advisor without pay, is the one to tell him, tell her to cook food and bring, and then when she brings, you rape her. But when the act has been done, you don't hear anything about Jonadab. There are friends like that in our lives. Our success gives them sleepless nights. Our fame, our, you know, seeming promotion i keep saying seeming promotion because everybody is promoted in their own way it's just that some of us have refused to see our own promotion we are only considering our lives as lives that are full of demotion and then eventually we lose sight of the blessings of god jonadab gives his friend bad advice and when his friend lands into trouble there's nobody to stand by him as a friend Try not to give your friend bad advice because what goes around comes around. Even if you take that person's position because the position was not meant for you before too long, another person will take the position. If you take your friend's husband, they always say that the broom that you used to sweep another person out, they hardly ever throw that broom. It's always beside the door because another person with more gabarit will come in and so sweep you out that it will be difficult to even gather the debt of your life. Let us be the kind of people who are not quick, who are not the, who are not envious, who are not jealous, who are not bitter to a point where we'll be doing things that we are not supposed to do. We'll be committing murder, we'll be gossiping, backstabbing, doing things here and there. Now you look at the example in the couple because marriage is a different ball game altogether. When it is the man who is successful, most times the woman is able to support the woman is able to tag along. I'm not saying what I'm saying as fiction. It is in the Bible. Look at the story of Zipporah. We're in Exodus chapter 4 from verse 24 to 26. Her husband is Moses and her husband is successful. God has called her husband for an assignment back in Egypt. And as Moses is going, God is angry because Moses has not circumcised his two sons. And to show that Zipporah is part of the equation, she quickly understands that that is what God, Zipporah is a stranger. She is a foreigner. But she understands by virtue of what she has learned from Moses that that is why God is angry. And she eventually circumstances her sons and savages Moses' life. When you are the kind of wife, when you are the kind of woman, when you are the kind of sister who is not beefing your husband's success, who is not angry because your husband is successful, you start saying that, ah, now he'll start seeing girls, oh, girls will start seeing him, oh, as if even if he's not successful, girls will not see him or he will not see girls. You start beefing and beefing, at the end of the day, you lose the blessings that were attached to that man's success if you had tagged along with him. Look at somebody like David. You can never mention David's story without talking about Jonathan. It's not possible. Because Jonathan understood that when he serves this anointing, he too will be blessed. It's the same way that Zipporah understood. Now instead of telling Moses that, Moses, you are not going back to Egypt. If she helps Moses, she will be the one to benefit. And Nothing is said about her after Moses is going to Egypt. But we know that she is still a wife because in Exodus 18 from verse 1 to 18, her father Jethro comes to visit Moses and gives Moses good advice. It means that Zipporah is still part and parcel of Moses' life even after his success. When we are supportive to our husbands, if our husbands are more famous or more known or more talented or more whatever you want to call it in English, call it, we too will be part of that success story. Let us not be the kind of people like Jezebel, who, instead of supporting the husband in a positive way, we take upon ourselves and abuse the power that our husband has. If you look at the story in 1 Kings 21, 1 to 16, this is an Ahab who is sulking and angry that Naboth has refused to sell his vineyard. And Jezebel takes upon herself like the Bakaranamozo that she wants to become. And she kills Naboth. You think that God spares her? God does not spare her. When God sends a warning to Ahab, Ahab goes and repents. 
God forgives. Jezebel does not repent. And at the end of the day, the same dogs that she caused to feed on, on Nabal, uh, Nabal's blood also fed on her own blood. When we beef others, when we abuse the power that God has given us or that God has put our dis at our disposal, there are always consequences. And most times, the consequences are negative. Now, if you have an instance of a successful wife, because it doesn't, there is nowhere in the Bible that says that it's only the man who has to be successful. No, sometimes God can decide to bless the woman with the, the success and everything that the family will benefit from. Look at the example of Deborah. The Bible does not say that Deborah is a free woman or that she's a widow. In Judges chapter 4 verse 4, the Bible says that she is the wife to Lapidot. De Deborah, on no occasion will you hear that her husband, there was a scandal, there was an issue because her husband Lapidot was supportive. Her husband did not say, how can I be here and you have become a judge and now it means that people will be listening to you, people will be seeing you, people, you will be popular, you will be famous. The man understood that if he supports his wife, Consequently, he too will be part of that blessing. He too will be part of that glory. He too will be part of the things that the Lord is using his wife to do. Deborah is not the only person. Look at Moses' mother. Her name is Jochebed. In Exodus chapter 2, from verse 1 to 10, Moses has a father. His name is Amram. Moses has a brother. His name is Aaron. But God does not use those two people. He chooses to use this woman. She's born. She's a Levite. She's born from the priestly family. God uses this woman because of her courage. And then God too uses Miriam because of her courage. What am I saying? Their husbands don't beef them. Uh, welcome, Papa Simon. Good to have you on board. The men in their life don't beef them because they are not suffering from inferiority complex. Because they are not suffering from, you know, hey, you don't pass me now. Me say I go talk, you know, go here. If you are sure of yourself, do the needful, the woman go stay here. And that is why if you look at even the instances of men who try to suppress their wives, who are unable to handle or cope with their wife's fame, the likes of Nabal. Their story is told in 1 Samuel 25, from verse 1 downwards. The Bible says that his name is fool. He names, his name means fool. And so he acts foolishly. This is somebody whom David has helped in the past. And now David has sent men to also ask for help. And it is not that he cannot give. It is not that he does not have. He just does not want to give. More grace to you to Bombo for me. And David is coming not to kill Nabal alone. David is coming to kill the whole family, his wife inclusive. But people have seen that Abigail is somebody who has clean water in her coconut. And they tell Abigail something. They report what has happened to her. And Abigail does not just assume. She does not just pray. Abigail acts. And she acts promptly. She goes ahead to do the needful to save David from killing their family. And what happens? God in his infinite mercy. He eventually kills Naba. We know the story. He eventually kills Naba. And what happens? The kind of wisdom that David, who is a correct man, though you will tell me that he's a womanizer, eh, but he was a womanizer. He was not chasing any kind of woman, women. He was chasing women who had, eh, yes, class and taste and water in their coconut. So he comes back for this Abigail because he sees that there's something special about this woman. If you don't value the person that God has blessed you with, or if you demean or devalue the person that God has blessed you with, simply because you think that she's more successful than you, or he's more successful than you, and then, you know, you know, at the end of the day, you will be the loser. Because at the end of the day, somebody who is more wise or wiser, who has more common sense, who has more clean water in his coconut. Welcome, Mama Akubai. Good to have you on board. Will eventually take her from you. And if you notice, despite the fact that David was collecting women here and there, a big girl stayed his wife until, till, 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 because David knew that this particular one, with the way she handled that situation, I need her by my side to handle the different kinds of situations that I will face in life. Welcome, Mama Becky. Good to have you on board. And so, conscious of all of us are conscious of what is happening now, what is trending on social media with a mama who has lost her life reportedly because her husband was beating her to death. As a matter of fact, it is not about how much we advise people. It is not about how much we say that the man was wrong or the man did not do this or the man did not do that. It is about we, in this holy week, getting it right before God. Because if we get it right with God, then we will get it right with man. 
Some of us are jealous. Some of us are envious. Some of us are unable to cope with the success of our children, the success of our parents, our siblings, our colleagues, our friends, our spouses, and what have you. If only we can be the kind of people who understand what Jonathan understood, that he is the rightful heir to the throne, yes, in 1 Samuel 18 and 1 Samuel 20. But he cannot fight this person who is anointed because nobody can fight the kind of person who David, God has blessed in the person of David and win. So Jonathan decides not to fight. He decides to support. He decides to be a part and parcel of the vision. He decides to be a part and parcel of the blessings upon God, um, David's life. Yes, he falls out with his father. But what happens when he is no longer there? David remembers their covenant and goes and looks for Mephibosheth. Imagine if Jonathan had been beefing David when Mephibosheth had found help. This man who reportedly beat his wife to death, if he had supported his wife's career, as other men that we hear that they support their, their, their wives who are music ministers, the, the wives themselves have testified that their husbands support them, their husbands are there by their side, their husbands do this. We ourselves have seen there are people in Congo, there are people in Ghana, there are people in Cameroon, I don't want to call names, but you know that their husbands support them. At the end of the day, who takes the credit? Is it not the husband? When you hear the, the sister before she sings or the mother, the mama before she sings, I want to thank my husband. You think she's thanking her husband for the fun of it? She's thanking her husband because thanks to his support, she's going to where she's supposed to go to. If you're a wife and you are beefing your husband, it is not going to help because at the end of the day, when the blessings come, you will not be part of it. There are always going to be people who are more successful than us in every area of life. But this is not to give us sleepless nights. This is not to make us restless. This is not to make us uncomfortable. This is to make us to go to God, to ask him to show us that which we too can excel at. There is nothing wrong in learning from another person. That this person is able to do this thing better than I am. I ask the person to teach me and I learn. It does not devalue me or add value to that person. It just makes me humble and able to learn. And so, as we get into this Holy Week, it should not just be Holy Week as usual. I said we're not going to exceed one hour. Welcome, Mama Domitila. Good to have you on board. Welcome, Mama Marcel. Good to have you on board. It should be the kind of Holy Week that we don't just wear black on Good Friday and go to church. It should be the kind of Holy Week that we don't just go through the, 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 the story of the crucifixion as usual. It should be the kind of Holy Week that we look inwards. And look at the character traits that we have in common with Judas. And look at the character traits that are causing us to be like the Pharisees in the church. Giving Jesus to the, or handing Jesus to the cross because of envy, because of jealousy. We should look at our lives in the family. What is that characteristic that is making your name to fit in the same sentence like Cain and Abel? Look at ourselves as friends. What is that characteristic that is making you have something in common with Jonathan, uh, Jonadab and Amnon? Look at yourself as a wife. Are you the kind of person who is Jezebel? Your name is not Jezebel, but when you look at yourself, it looks as if Jezebel's characteristics are in you. Jezebel's lifestyle, Jezebel's perception is in you in one way or the other. Or as a husband, we look at ourselves. We want to find out whether we are the kind of Nabals. Our names might not be Nabals, but <laughs> what is true for Nabal is true for us. It is time to go to God. And ask for mercy. And as we ask for mercy, we should learn from the good examples. You can be a good husband like Lapidot. You can be a good friend like Jonathan. You can be a good wife like Zipporah. You can be a, a, a good brother like Joseph, like David. You can be a good church member like the likes of Barnabas and the rest who were there to ensure that the church of Christ is marching forward, not because one person is winning, but because the gospel is being preached to the ends of the earth. May God bless his word in Jesus' name. Amen. If Christ is not your Lord and Savior of your life, it is important for you to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, not just by word of mouth, but by virtue of the way that we intend to live our lives from this holy week onwards. It is time. The Bible says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone, anyone who hears my voice 
and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. And so we want to bow our heads this evening and pray. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Nobody is too bad for God to save. If he saved the thief on the cross, he can save even you, even today. And so let's just bow our heads as we pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We pray that you have mercy upon us. Lord, wash us with the blood of the Lamb. We acknowledge the fact that we have sinned against you in more ways than one. Lord, forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, wash us with the blood of the Lamb. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our lives. Wipe our names from the book of death and write our names in the Lamb's book of life. Give us the grace not to go back to our old ways. Help us to run this race to the end so that, Lord, when you call us home or when you come back to take your own home, our names will not be found missing in the Lamb's book of life. Where we are weak, that he make us strong. Give us the grace to do that which is pleasant in your sight for your glory. Thank you, Master Jesus. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer from the bottom of your heart, welcome, Mama Mimi. Good to have you on board. It is time to find the Bible. Make sure that you read the Bible and you take down notes of what the Holy Spirit is teaching you over time. Also try to find a Bible-believing church. The church is not a gathering of angels. In the church, you will have different difficulties. But as you fellowship with the brethren, iron will sharpen iron and God will take you from strength to strength. Before we part company, let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we have spent in your presence. We thank you because you started with us as Alpha and you are ending with us as Omega. We thank you for everyone who connected tonight and everyone who will eventually connect to watch later. Lord, we pray that you meet us at the point of need. Lord, do that which only you can do. Father, wherever we have been envious, wherever we have been jealous, we have been bitter, we have been the kind of people who commit murder, who do things which are not pleasant in your sight, Lord, have mercy. On our own, we cannot do it. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Therefore, Lord, give us the grace to celebrate when others are winning. Because we know that in the process of celebrating, you will give us cause to, to celebrate. Father, we know that in your mercy, you will empower us. You will equip us. You will give us the grace not to beef others, not to be envious of others. Lord, but to be there as a brother and as a sister. Father, even as we depart tonight, we remember Mama Osinachi's family. Lord, comfort the children. Lord, even the husband, visit him in a way that only you can. Because, Lord, there's no man whom you cannot reach if you were able to reach Apostle Paul. Therefore, Lord, reach out to him in a way that only you can. For us, the onlookers, give us the grace to do that which is right before you. So that when you call us home, our, our, our balance sheet, our account will not be one that will be unpleasant. They will be one that will be pleasant. Father, we thank you. We cover this word with the blood of Jesus and pray that, Lord, your spirit will continue to amplify it in our hearts even after we have departed from here. Thank you for everyone who connected. Do us good. Meet us at the point of need and take the glory from start to finish. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you everyone for joining. Good night. God bless us all. Shalom. <laughs>